These following stories are taken from the latest series of my podcast, Deliver Us, which is available on Apple Podcasts and most other podcasting platforms. For those new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy my storytelling and check out the podcast in the links in the channel description. This episode is a little different from my usual format. It is actually an excerpt from the book The Haunting of Martin's Croft by Duke Astinius, who has kindly allowed me to narrate it for a podcast episode. Welcome to Deliver Us. Chapter 1. An Introduction to the Yolavi Devil In the winter of 1885, a series of mysterious occurrences began to take place in an old croft house in Iolavi, Finland, inhabited by Ephraim Martin and his wife Eva. It all started with Mrs. Martin and their maidservant, Emma Lindrews, witnessing how the living room door kept opening by itself even though there was no one in the entryway. The disturbances soon escalated into plaster falling down from the walls and various household items being hurled around the house by some invisible entity. Sometimes the Martins could even hear a kind of hog-like grunting coming from some dark corner in the house, but they could never see anyone or anything suspicious. As the disturbances continued, curious onlookers began to visit the Martin Croft house, hoping to get a glimpse of the infamous Yeolavi Devil. Eventually, newspapers all over the country also began to write about the incidents in Yeolavi. Articles about allegedly haunted houses had been published in newspapers before, but never before had one single case garnered such nationwide attention. In fact, the entire township of Yeolavi was not particularly well known at the time. In 1885, Iolavi was a small rural township of less than 2,600 people. Its administrative centre, the church town, was located approximately 10 miles from the city of Tamafors, which had a population of over six times that of Iolavi. Ever since the founding of the township in 1869, the township manager of Iolavi had been Ifray Martin, whose house was now allegedly haunted. The Croft House was located only a mile from the church and on the other side of Lake Kayavi, and the old couple was well known by everyone in the community. They were known to be honest, reliable, and deeply religious, and they did not have a reputation for being particularly superstitious. There seemed to be no motive for the Martins to lie about the disturbances, and as more people visited the house, it became clear that something else was going on. Dozens of people who visited the Martin Croft house could later swear that whatever it was, it was not a hoax, that whatever they had witnessed was caused by some unknown, incomprehensible force. As word about the mysterious occurrences in Yolavi spread to the neighbouring townships and the city of Tamifors in particular, the number of the so-called devil onlookers grew even more. Many of these out-of-town visitors did not know the Martins personally and acted violently towards the Martins and their maidservant. In addition, They often brought liquor with them when they visited the Martins. Their trips were not motivated by a desire to unravel the mystery behind the alleged supernatural events. For them, it was all about having fun with absolutely no regards to what they were doing to the Martins. Sixteen days after the haunting had started, the disturbances suddenly ceased. Eventually, the stream of onlookers also dried up. Unfortunately, however, the damage had already been done. Since many of the devil onlookers had been seemingly intoxicated during their visits, rumours began to spread that the inhabitants of the Croft House had sold alcohol to their guests. It was even rumoured that the Martins had staged the haunting in order to attract as many people to their house as possible. In Iolavi, where people knew the Martins personally, people knew how preposterous these rumours were. Elsewhere, however, it was widely believed that this was the case. Hence, approximately one month after the cessation of the disturbances, the Crown Sheriff of Berkela County, Casimir Lildestrand, received a letter from Governor von Amont, ordering him to initiate a criminal investigation against the Martins and their 13-year-old maidservant, Emma Wilhelmina Lindrus. Eventually, the case ended up in court, where Crown Sheriff Lildestrand accused the Martins of illegal sale of hard liquor and practising superstition. Charges had been brought against the Martins' maidservant as well, but she had been unable to attend the trial due to health problems. It is actually because of the fact that the case went to court why it has been documented in such great detail. Out of the 15 witnesses called to testify, 
14 described in great detail how mysterious occurrences had taken place inside the Croft House and swore that they were caused by some, at least to them, unknown force. The court was never able to prove that the defendants had caused the disturbances, which is why many believers in the paranormal later regarded it as proof of the supernatural. The case has been studied by paranormal investigators, even outside of Finland, many of whom consider it to be a genuine case of poltergeist activity. However, most of these studies often lack a critical scientific approach to the eyewitness testimonies. Psychical researchers have later attributed the manifestations at the Martin Croft House to a poltergeist, the psychic powers of the adolescent maidservant Emma Wilhelmina Lindrus, or a combination of the two. Yet, in 1885, Emma Lindrus was never suspected of having such powers. She was suspected of staging the events, but she was never suspected of possessing supernatural powers, until years later. In addition, the word poltergeist was not used once during the haunting. This was not to say the word poltergeist was not yet in use in Finland. The word had been in use for decades, at least among the Swedish-speaking population, but it was not as widely used as it is in the 21st century. In the 18th century, the term always had a specific German connotation. Moreover, the contemporary news media had never really speculated on the possible explanations for the manifestations, if not counting the article suggesting that it was Emma Lindrews who had staged all of the events. At the time, the incident was simply referred to as the Devil of Yolavi. Sometimes the disturbances were attributed to gnomes, sometimes to ghosts, although it was never really even suggested that it was the spirit of a deceased person who was haunting the Martins. As years turned into decades, the name Iolavi Devil, or the Devil of Iolavi, became less frequently used. Sometimes the 1885 incident was referred to simply as the Wonders of Iolavi. Eventually, people in Iolavi began to refer to the incident as the Devils of Martin, or the Demons of Martin, in the plural, which is interesting due to the fact that in 1885 it was always referred to in the singular as the Iolavi Devil. Even today, when the topic is discussed in more paranormal circles or in a more academic context, the case is usually referred to as a poltergeist case. When it comes to alleged poltergeist activity, the Olavi Devil case is one of the most well-known historical poltergeist cases in Northern Europe. In Finland, it rivals the 1946 Magkilla poltergeist as the most famous poltergeist case of all time. And it is definitely the most famous poltergeist case to take place in the Grand Duchy of Finland. It is a fairly common mistake to associate the 1885 Iolavi Devil case with the witch hunts of the 16th and 17th centuries. This problem usually results from a failure to consider its historical context. In order to understand the events that transpired in Iolavi in 1885, as well as the ensuing criminal proceedings against the Martins and Emmett Lindrus, it is imperative to understand the world they were living in. In fact, the Martins actually lived in relatively modern times. To illustrate the matter, the events transpired closer to the invention of the smartphone than when the last person was executed for witchcraft in Finland. Moreover, it was only three years before the first motion picture was ever filmed. Yet, since it is all history, people have a tendency to lump everything together. Witchcraft, inquisitions, the Eeyore Lovey Devil case, etc. Saturday, January 17th, 1885. Later on that same Saturday, more people arrived to see what was happening at the Martin Croft House. Blacksmith Gerhard Grenfors, who had lived in the neighbouring Makkilla village, had heard rumours about the supernatural manifestations, but had simply dismissed them as nonsense. When Taylor Gustav Helene told him about the sconce that had spontaneously broken off from the calendar holder, he still thought there must have been a natural explanation for everything. His curiosity was nevertheless aroused by the stories. Hence, on that Saturday night, he decided to go with Taylor Helene to the haunted Croft House to see what was going on. Grunfors, Helene and some other men, possibly Henrik Asuntula, arrived at the Martin Croft House late at night when it was already pitch dark outside. In the living room they found Emma Lindrus, the Martins, and Rustula Ephraim Erula, who had also come to visit. For a while, it was beginning to look a lot like everything was normal. Nothing had occurred even during the visit that would have convinced blacksmith Grunfus of the alleged supernatural activity. Then, around 10pm, 
While the men were conversing in the living room, a shoemaker's awl flew all of a sudden from the southeast corner of the room and landed on the floor between Emma Lindrus's bed and the doorway. When the incident happened, Grunforce and Helene had been standing next to the dining table talking to Mr. Martin. Emma Lindrus had been sitting at the table eating supper, while Eva Martin had been lying on her bed, which was located in the same corner from which the awl had appeared. Blacksmith Grunforce was suspicious. Although he could not think of a reason, he knew that Mrs. Martin could have easily thrown the awl, since it seemed to have come from the same corner as where she had been. Then, shortly after the incident with the awl, something happened that finally convinced the blacksmith that something was not right in the Croft House, that whatever was going on was not caused by Mrs. Martin. Everyone who was present in the room was stunned when all of a sudden a pair of women's shoes started to move by themselves across the living room floor. The shoes appeared from a dark corner in the room, and were now approaching the middle of the floor. They were moving one after the other, and when they reached the middle of the room they suddenly stopped. Some of the visitors now picked them up to inspect them, but found no wires attached to them. Grundfors knew that no one had been in that corner where the shoes had come from. When a moment later a small birch barn basket flew by itself through the air and hit the living room door, there was no doubt left in his mind that the manifestations were of supernatural origin. That same night, when blacksmith Grunfors and Ephraim Martin were about to leave the living room and headed toward the entryway, a psalm book suddenly came flying from behind them and hit the door so hard that the entire room echoed. For a deeply religious man such as Mr. Martin, this was clearly blasphemy. It was one thing to go after all the trivial household items that the entity had targeted earlier, but it was quite another to mess with his religious literature. The Last Day of the Haunting on Tuesday, January 27th, the Martins were paid a visit by the verger of Yulavi Chapelry, Carl Frithiof Lindel, and his wife Amanda. Although the Martins and the Lindels had known each other for years, this was the first time during the alleged paranormal activity when they visited the haunted house. As it turned out to be the last day of the haunting, it was also the only time the Lindels visited the Martins during the strange occurrences. Obviously, no one knew at the time that the disturbances would soon be over. Ephraim Martin had invited Carl Frithioff to come over, so that together they could write down everything that was going on at the Croft House, and then submit the article to one of the local newspapers in Tamforce to have it published. When the Lindels entered the Martins' living room, Amanda first took her seat on a stool next to Eva Martin's bed. Her husband, Carl Frithioff, headed toward the middle of the room. It was at that moment when a wooden stool suddenly bounced up in the air and landed upside down in the middle of the floor. It landed right in front of Carl Frithiof's feet, who then took the stool, turned it around and placed it under his foot. Lindel inspected the stool, but could not find any wires attached to it that could have been used to make it bounce. After the incident, everything remained calm and quiet for a while. While inside the living room, Mr. Martin and the verger began to draft an article about the haunting. In addition to the Martins and the Lindrels, there was only Emma Lindrews present in the room. Emma Lindrews, who had fallen ill, had been lying in her bed the entire time. Although there was no one else in the room, every now and then they could hear a loud thudding and rumble coming from somewhere inside the house. This made the verger, who was trying to concentrate on writing the article, very uneasy. Then, all of a sudden, a ragged old mitten filled with needles flew out of nowhere and landed at Verger Lindel's feet. At this point, Eva Martin had also been lying in her bed, so it did not even cross the Lindros' mind that either Mrs. Martin or Emma Lindros could have thrown the mitten. Carl Frithioff Lindel now asked Ifray Martin if there was another place they could write their story, since it was impossible to concentrate with all the distraction. Mr. Martin then suggested that they would go to the so-called lower cabin. The two men left the Croft House and walked across the yard to the other side where the lower cabin was located. When Carl Frithioff Lindel and Ephraim Martin arrived in the lower cabin, they immediately began to write the story. At some point, the verger decided to take a break and step outside. When he was opening the door, he heard a strange whoosh from behind. Before he had time to turn around, a wooden shingle basket hit him on his side. As he was turning, he had seen how the basket had flown toward him in the air moving unnaturally slowly. Yet, it had been making a peculiar whooshing sound as if it had been moving at an extremely high speed. The basket was so light that when it hit Verger, it did not leave a mark, or cause any pain for that matter. 
After the incident, it was all quiet in the lower cabin, and the two men were able to finish their story. No other unexplained occurrences took place during that time. When Ephraim Martin and Virgil Lindell had gone to the lower cabin, Amanda Lindell had stayed in the living room with Eva Martin and Emma Lindrus. While the women were inside talking to each other, suddenly plaster began to fall down from the walls, as had happened during the first days of the haunting. Next, three old shoes flew from one of the corners and landed in the middle of the living room floor. The women could easily see that no one had been in that corner from where the shoes had come from. As the plaster was still falling from the walls, they began to hear a thudding sound. They realised that the sound was coming from the dining table at the south end of the room. It was a large wooden table, with folding leaves at each end. The large wooden leaves of the table were now banging spontaneously against the table legs. Amanda Linda was terrified. She immediately ran out of the building and hurried to the lower cabin to get her husband and Mr. Martin. Amanda Linda ran across the yard, and when she stepped outside the lower cabin, Mr. Martin and her husband were already getting ready to leave. They had finally finished writing the article. Amanda now told the men what was happening, and when they stepped outside they could hear a loud rumbling noise coming down the hill from the croft house. Emma Lindrews and Mrs. Martin had stayed in the house and were still inside. Mr. Martin and the Lindrews now hurried across the yard toward the main building. Virgil Lindor, who was the fastest of the three, got inside first, where he found the wooden leaves of the dining table banging against the table legs. The verger fearlessly lifted one of the leaves, but could not see anything suspicious under the table, nothing that could have caused the movement. The banging had, of course, stopped as he had lifted the leaves, but when he let go of the table, the banging started again. By that time, Ephraim Martin and Amanda Lindell had also arrived in the living room. Now the leaves began to hit against the table frame even faster. The banging was so intense that the entire room echoed. Lindell then fearlessly grabbed one of the leaves and pressed his knee against it in order to keep it from moving. While he was successful in stopping that piece from moving, the other leaf began to bang against the table frame even harder. Ephraim Martin also tried to see if there was something under the table that could have caused the movement, but found nothing amiss. The folding leaves of the table were just spontaneously banging against the table legs. In order to stop the movement, the men decided to take a piece of rope and tie it around the table. After they had tied the leaves to the rest of the table, they inserted several wedges under the rope to make it even tighter. As the men were inserting the wedges, they could hear a strange sound coming from beneath the table. It sounded somewhat like a puffing or panting sound, but there was nothing under the table where the sound could have originated from. No one else was even close to the table at that moment. Now that the leaves could no longer move, the entire table began to bounce in the air. Similar to many of the previous occurrences, the bouncing also took place exactly three times. Each time it had jumped approximately one inch in the air. The men then grabbed the table and moved it in the middle of the room, after which it stopped moving. After waiting for a while, Ephraim Martin untied the rope around the table and threw it on the floor in front of the doorway. He wanted to see if the table would start moving again, but this time nothing happened. Virgil Lindell then helped Mr. Martin move the table back against the wall where it had been. For a short while, it remained quiet in the house. Emma Lindrews, who had been lying in her bedroom on the floor the entire time, now fell asleep again. A moment later, Emma woke up realising that the same rope that had been used to tie the table a moment earlier was now tied around her. She immediately sat up on her bed yelling, Now it's tied me too! The rope had been mysteriously tied around her waist several times. The others now rushed to help Emma, who had already started untying the rope. Ephraim Martin and Karl Frithioff eventually sent their article to the Armuleti to have it published. Although the Armuleti was still reporting about the events in the Olavi, it decided not to publish the one written by Martin and Lindell. For reasons unknown, the newspaper seemed to not be interested in hearing their side of the story. After the events witnessed by the Lindells at the Martin Croft House, the inexplicable occurrence ceased, and this time for good. There were, nevertheless, rumours that some incidents had occurred even after that. For instance, on January 31st, the Tamperine Sanomat reported that the devil had returned to the Martin Croft House on January 28th, 
but it did not elaborate on the topic and there is no record of what had allegedly occurred on that Wednesday. On March 26, 1885, it was also stated in the Tamperine Sanomat that according to the Martins, the last phenomenon at the Croft House was when a table was knocked on, and that took place on Tuesday, January 27th, which suggests that the incident involving Emma Lindrews and the rope was not the last incident that took place on that Tuesday. However, it is possible that the table that was knocked on referred simply to the incident witnessed by the Lindrews, where the folding leaves of the dining table had banged against the table frame, even though, according to the Lindrules, it was not the last inexplicable occurrence they witnessed. Either way, what is known that after Tuesday, January 27th, the haunting was finally over, and the Martins could finally get on with their lives. However, people, eager to see even a glimpse of the devil, would still keep visiting the Martins for days to come. Verdict and Judgment in his closing argument, Ephraim Martin first corroborated verger Carl Frithioff Lindell's testimony that Emma Lindrews had occasionally thrown objects around their house. Just as the verger had testified, she had only wanted to joke around with the others. According to the defendant, Emma had been influenced by the example set by many of the visitors, who had played similar pranks at their residence. Often times after dark, when there had been many onlookers present, one of the onlookers had thrown objects from some dark corner in the house, yelling out, The devil is once again on the move. If Frey Martin believed this is how the rumours regarding Emma's involvement got started. Finally, he requested that he and his wife be exonerated from all charges against them, since it had been demonstrated that the Martins had nothing to do with the disturbances that had taken place at their home. The public prosecutor, Casimir Lilderstrand, now announced that during the examination, no incriminating evidence had surfaced against the defendants Ephraim and Eva Martin, or Emma Lindrews for that matter. There was no reasonable grounds to suspect the defendants of being guilty of either of the offences defined in the charge. Neither was there sufficient reason to adjourn the trial so that Emma Lindrews could be questioned. Therefore, Lilderstrand saw no reason to continue with the charges against the defendants, and left the issue for the court to decide. The defendants then requested to be reimbursed for their legal expenses. In addition, all the 15 witnesses also requested they be compensated for appearing in court. They had all verified that their witness testimonies had been correctly understood and recorded in the court transcript by the courtroom clerk, Carl Johann Sedenius. The court took the requests under advisement and retired to deliberate its judgment. After everything had been recorded in the transcript by the courtroom clerk, the defendants were free to go if they pleased. The Birkala Harad District Court reached its verdict and delivered its decisions on the case only a moment after it had withdrawn to deliberate. As could have been anticipated, after the prosecutor had dropped all charges against the defendants, the court found the Martins, as well as Emma Lindrews, not guilty on all accounts. In its reasons for judgment, the court elaborated that the witnesses had unanimously stated that the inexplicable occurrences at the Martin Croft House had been caused by forces that were unknown, at least to the witnesses, excluding the pranks played by Emma Lindrews as well as several onlookers. In its reasons for the judgment, the court elaborated that the witnesses had unanimously stated that the inexplicable occurrences at the Martin Croft House had been caused by forces that were unknown, at least to the witnesses, excluding the pranks played by Emma Lindrews as well as several onlookers. Even if the occurrences had been caused by the defendants through the use of trickery, no crime had been committed, since the defendants clearly had not harmed anyone or tried to profit from the occurrences. In addition, no evidence had surfaced to suggest that the defendants had sold alcohol to their guests. The decision of the Harad District Court was then submitted to the Imperial Abu High Court for its approval. Reasons for the Judgment The Harad District Court has taken the matter into final consideration and has found through the evidence presented and what has transpired during the trial, that it has been well demonstrated that in the Croft House inhabited by the defendants Ephraim and Eva Martin, on the Irola Rustal's land in the village of Kiyavi in this Iolavi Chapelry, during the time period from the 12th of January to the 28th of the same month, all sorts of disturbances had occurred, such that objects in the rooms had been hurled back and forth, the furniture had moved around and other such things, and that these movements and events would have been caused partially first and foremost according to the unanimously expressed conviction of the examined witnesses, by some, at least to them, unknown force, and, partially during the latter time of this time period, as pranks by the defendant Emma Lindrews as well as other people who had temporarily been present at the Croft House, 
who, however, were always ready to confess their pranks without trying to hide what they had done. However, since it has been proven that defendants had not been causing those incidents that were never confessed by anyone and were regarded as unexplained by the witnesses, or that these incidents would have occurred as a result of the defendant's incitement or with their knowledge and consent, and no better clarity on the latter circumstances can be obtained anymore, since no other persons than those who have already been examined under oath were present at the aforementioned Croft House at such times when such events had been observed by the witnesses. Therefore, in the court's opinion, no crime against existing laws and regulations can be regarded to have occurred, even if the accused had committed such pranks by using secret hatches, hidden wires, or other tricks, and even less can the provisions in the Criminal Codes Chapter 2, Section 2, regarding witchcraft and superstition, be applied to the present court case, since it has been demonstrated that the defendants had neither benefited from the events, nor had they caused injury to others and neither had the defendants claimed to have employed the help of some supernatural force, as stated in the above-mentioned criminal code provisions. Likewise, the accusation regarding illegal sale of hard liquor has also been found to have no basis. Therefore, the Hara District Court, which does not under these circumstances find it necessary to hear the underage defendant Emma Lindrews, whose contraction of a severe and life-threatening illness has been legally verified, will dismiss all charges as completely unfounded. However, since the prosecutor had insignated the prosecution ex officio and on explicit orders from her governor of the province, the Hadar District Court cannot reimburse the defendants for their legal expenses, nor can it pay witness fees to the witnesses who were examined during the proceeding. However, this decision shall be submitted, according to Chapter 25, Section 5 of the Code of Judicial Procedure, to the Imperial Abu High Court for closer examination, in which regard the transcript of the examination and judgment shall be written as soon as possible and sent, together with the original documents that were presented during the trial, to the Honourable Court. Announced upon convening, time and location above. On behalf of the Hara District Court, Werner Palander. Those were some long sentences. So this concludes the excerpt from the book The Haunting of Martin's Croft, the true story of the 1885 Eolavi poltergeist by Jacu Stinius. The book is available in paperback and Kindle edition from Amazon, so if you want to know the full story, go ahead and check out the link in the description to this episode. I would like to thank Jaku for allowing me to narrate this excerpt, and you, my listeners, for listening to this podcast. This concludes my first official season for this podcast. I will be going on a break from releasing new episodes whilst I research and write new stories for my second season. If you have a story you would like me to tell, please email me at mrsinisterstories at gmail.com. That's Mr. spelt M-R, sinisterstories at gmail.com. I do look forward to returning with more episodes in the fall. Thank you again for listening.